This episode of Harvey Brownstone Interviews is brought to you by the Harvey Brownstone Talk Show Blend Coffee, available at hollywoodblends.com. Everyone's saying it's the best coffee they've ever tasted. Why not give it a try and see for yourself? Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's guest is a highly acclaimed director, choreographer, and producer who's brought us some of the most beloved and iconic Broadway shows. As a dancer, he appeared in the first national tour of the Best Little Whorehouse in Texas, and he made his Broadway debut in Seven Brides for Seven Brothers, and then replaced Tommy Toon for a limited engagement, co-starring with Twiggy in My One and Only. He's directed and or choreographed many Broadway shows, including the Will Rogers Follies, for which his collaboration with Tommy Toon won the Tony Award for Best Choreography. He also brought us the first Broadway revival of Grease, for which he earned a Drama Desk Award nomination and a Tony Award nomination for Best Choreography. Annie Get Your Gun, Big River, for which he received the Tony Award for Excellence in Theater, and two Los Angeles Drama Critics Circle Awards for Best Director and Best Choreography. Great Gardens, Bonnie and Clyde, for which he won two San Diego Theatre Critics Circle Awards for Best Director of a Musical and Outstanding New Musical. Jekyll and Hyde and Newsies, for which he earned a Tony Award nomination for Best Direction of a Musical. Our guest has brought groundbreaking productions to the world famous Deaf West Theatre in Los Angeles, including Oliver, Big River and Pippin and he also directed the world premiere of the first original American Sign Language musical, Sleeping Beauty Wakes, for which he won the 2007 Ovation Award for Best World Premiere Musical. He also directed both the world premiere and international stage productions of Disney's High School Musical and Disney's High School Musical 2. And he directed the national tours of two immensely popular shows, Irving Berlin's White Christmas and Dolly Parton's Nine to Five, The Musical. I'm delighted to welcome the mega talented Jeff Calhoun to our show. Jeff, thank you so much for being here. Oh, Harvey, what a pleasure it is to meet you. I've enjoyed watching you and it's really thrilling to be here. Well, it's a great thrill to have you here. You know, we've had a lot of legendary Broadway directors and choreographers like yourself on our show, like Larry Fuller, Jerry mm -hmm. Mitchell, Bayork Lee, Tom Moore, John McDaniel and others. And they've all talked about that one moment when they fell in love with Broadway musicals and knew that they had to be a part of that world. Can you recall when that moment was for you? Wow, I don't recall when it was the stage that attracted me. I just remember sitting at home watching the Ernie Flat Dancers on the Kel Burnett Show and wanting to be one of them and watching the Fred Astaire movies and Gene Kelly and Donald O'Connor and Buddy Ebsen, and then, I, so it was really the TV and the film that got me interested in, in, in musicals. The first stage musical, I think I saw, I double dated with my brother, and I can't believe my parents let me go. I think it was a production of Hair at the Nixon Theater, downtown Pittsburgh. And I think that was the first live show I ever saw, but I can't remember thinking, oh, I wanted to do that until, I saw Chorus Line. And I think when I saw Chorus Line on Broadway, because I was a dancer, I identified so much with that subject matter. I think that's when I went, oh, maybe I could do that for a living. Well, and then speaking of dancers, your association with Tommy Toon was really pivotal in your career. You've said many times, Jeff, that you owe your career to Tommy Toon. What would you say was the most important thing you learned from him? Well, that I'm that I'm not the genius he is, <laughs> first of all. Yeah, Tommy Toon and my parents were the most influential adults in my life. And I met Tommy at the Kenley Players, a remarkable man we can talk about later. Truly a remarkable man, Mr. Kenley. I think I learned most everything I know about putting on a show from just the basic rules about what's the strongest entrance, the difference between playing a scene upstage and downstage, and also just how he used his, his, his imagination to transfer the page to the stage. He's really a true, true artist. And that's not false modesty when I say, I learned that I'm not the genius he is because Tommy Toon is truly an artist, uh, a rare artist, and there are a few that have been like him. 
Why did you decide to stop performing and become a choreographer and director? I always really wanted to be a director. Even when I was a little kid, I would get all the neighborhood kids around and we'd put on shows in my grandmother's garage. She had one of those old fashioned garage you'd pull up and the door would go up. And I remember stopping it halfway up because of uh, the 42nd Street and just seeing legs and then going up further. And my mom would make popcorn and lemonade and we would sell that. We put folding chairs in the driveway. And I always just, I don't know if I just wanted to be the boss, but I always had an imagination where I wanted to use my friends to tell fun stories and to entertain people. It was the happiest I think I ever was, was being in a theater or on a stage. And now behind the scenes, I mean, you clearly love that. Yeah, I, I said to you before we started taping that I no longer have that actor ego. This is difficult for me. Just, you know, I feel very self-conscious talking about myself because it's always the plays the thing. And now as a director, you're in the back of the house, you've already done your work. And then it's a question of observing it and, and figuring out how to make it better. And I like being on the outside looking in, to be honest. I'm, I'm happiest then. Okay, so we'll talk about other people. Besides Tommy <laughs> Toon. <laughs> Thank you. Besides Tommy Toon, you've worked with many great legends, including Cy Coleman, Betty Comden, Adolph Green, Stephen Schwartz, John Kenley, Peter Stone, and so many more. Is there one person who stands out in your mind as having impressed you the most? Oh, God, I think I've taken away something profound from every one of those people you mentioned. I mean, I was so lucky doing the Will Rogers Follies, and that was really my first big break on Broadway. And being around the likes of Asai Coleman and Betty and Adolph and Peter Stone, I think I was more in awe than anything. Uh, so I, I think I've taken away, and I try every day to, to learn something that I didn't know the day before, whether it's from an iconic theater person or just from my engagement with people on the bus or on the subway. I just try to learn something and to not only learn something, but I try to make other people's lives better that I encounter. Life's hard enough. So I figured when you leave that front door, you have an obligation to do the best you can to not bring anyone down, but to try to enhance their life in any way that you can. And certainly those people you mentioned have done that to my life. Well, I'm really intrigued by your instincts, Jeff, about choosing the people you want to collaborate with. For example, you chose Ivan Menchel to write the book for Bonnie and Clyde, even though he'd only written comedies and he initially didn't want to do it. How did you know that he was the right person for the job? Oh, I, I read, he did a script to a pop, uh, Prince and the Pauper that I thought was really, really well written. And I don't remember how that came across my desk, but I know when I met with Frank Wildhorn and he talked about doing Bonnie and Clyde, I, Ivan was the first name that came to mind. And I flew out to Los Angeles. I wouldn't tell him before that why I was coming out or the name of the show. And so I sat down with him and he said, all right, what's the big buildup? What's the show? And I said, Bonnie and Clyde. And without missing a beat, he said to me, oh, Jeff, no, I can write Jews on a shopping spree, but not Gentiles on a shooting spree. And I said, well, that's exactly why you need to be the one. I want to be in the room with you the rest of my life. He's the funniest person that I know. Well, second funniest. Dom DeLuise was pretty darn funny, too. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, you know, Bonnie and Clyde was nominated for two Tony Awards, four Drama Desk Awards, and a Drama League Award, and it's had many successful productions around the world. But on Broadway, the show closed after 33 previews and 36 performances. Why do you think the show didn't last longer on Broadway? Yeah, it was heartbreaking because the performances were so good. I think Ivan's book is really wonderful. One of Frank Wildhorn's best scores Harvey, I don't really know the answer. We've only speculated. And for some reason, Frank Wildhorn, the critics were not enamored with Frank. And there are many rumors as to why that is. But I think they just had some personal vendetta about Frank and we all suffered for it. And it's a shame because it's it was a great score. And Frank is one of my best friends and just such a mensch and a wonderful, wonderful man. Well, in my opinion, Frank will go down in history as one of America's great songwriters, don't you think? A hundred percent. People aren't going to remember the names of the critics, but they'll remember Frank Wildhorn. Do you think the critics still have the power to kill a show, even today? I do. 
I don't think it's what it was because of social media, but absolutely, you can you can just see the difference at the box office the day after a review, whether it's pro or con, a hundred percent. That's really a shame because I would have thought that social media, you know, everybody can be a critic now and publish all kinds of opinions. So I would have thought that critics' opinions would be diluted, but it's disheartening to hear from you that they can still kill a show. Well, it has diminished their power, but it's certainly there, absolutely, especially within the industry because everyone reads them. And so whether they say they don't or not, most people do read reviews. And this is a very tough business. And you are only as popular as your last show. And if a critic writes something good about you, your phone tends to ring. And if they write something bad about you, it can be very lonely and quiet for quite some time. There's a saying that it takes three times to get a show right, a workshop, an out-of-town production, and Broadway. Do you agree with that, Jeff? Oh, uh, at least. Absolutely. I think three is the right number. It, well, the exception, I guess, would be the Will Rogers Follies. I think it only played in New York. Yeah, we were, it was too expensive, Harvey, to take out of town. So we were forced to do all of the dirty work and the, the making of the sausage right at the Palace Theatre in Times Square and Previews were really difficult. I left the theater on more than one occasion in tears because, you know, in theater, there's no substitute for time. And until a show is good, it's not. <laughs> and it's hard, but, you know, it's I, that was also such a lesson for me, how it's a domino effect. You can change one little thing and the rest, and it, it affects the rest of the show. I think the, the most obvious example that comes to mind right now is a funny thing happened on the way to the forum. It was not doing well until they came up with Comedy Tonight, the opening number, and that changed everything that followed. So it's uh, three times is really, yes, you have to first see it on stage for the first time or in a rehearsal room for the first time. And most often that's a backers audition. So then you have producers there and hopefully it goes well enough that they see the potential that you get an out of town or a regional production. And then if that is successful and you're lucky and the stars are aligned, you get a uh, future life in New York. Now I have to confess to you that I'm a bit of a taboo fanatic. Uh -huh. I'm really, I, I, partly because I loved the show and I love Rosie O'Donnell. Now mm -hmm. I know you worked as a consultant on taboo. I had John McDaniel on the show and Charles Bush. Mm -hmm. and Each of them had very strong opinions about why the show failed. So I'm dying to ask you, Jeff, do you think the show deserves another shot? It's a remarkable score. And so I think for that reason alone, it deserves another shot. Absolutely. Why shows succeed and fail are inexplicable. And to be honest, Charles and John were both closer to the project and probably would have more intelligent answers than I can give you. I just know that I loved working with the cast. I was in awe of Boy George. I know Rosie loved the show and did her best. And so, I do think if great minds got together, there is a way to resurrect that show and make it seen by as many people as it deserves to be seen by. Do you learn as much from a show that was a flop as you do from a show that was a hit? Oh, I think you learn more. Really? I, I mean, when you have a hit, I'm not sure that you learn anything. You certainly have a good time and make more money, but it doesn't force you to sit down and look at, hmm, why was that successful? I think you, in a way, maybe you take it for granted. Maybe we shouldn't. But personally, when a show doesn't work, you're forced to kind of look at your work and go, well, was I anyway instrumental in its demise? Was there something I could have done better? Or uh, I know I did a show once that was not successful. And I only did it because it was possible to do. And the lesson there learned was, just because you can do something doesn't necessarily mean you should. And so I think I can go back in all the failures and, and give you some kind of philosophy of what I learned from that. I'm not sure I could do the same with the hits, but they sure are more fun. <laughs> but if you can do something and you know you can do it well and you want to do it, how do you know whether you should? Yeah. I think it's like Robert Frost talked about the secret confessions a man makes in his heart is his greatest source of wisdom. And I think if you're honest with yourself, I know if I'm honest with myself and I look back at this one particular show I'm talking about, it was selfish to go forward because 
I don't think we had all the right ingredients at the time. Is that something that you can figure out afterwards easier than while it's happening? Truth be told, I knew it at the time, but I was too young and too ambitious. And it was a lesson learned. It was a great lesson learned. Does every but, show make you a better storyteller? I hope so. I mean, that's what I'm counting on. I don't think I've done my best work yet. And I'm hoping and I believe that my next show will be better than the one before. When you direct a revival of a classic show like Grease or Annie Get Your Gun, what's your approach to striking a balance between respecting the original production and at the same time making your production fresh and current? Yeah, it's a good question. That certainly is the goal. I feel guilty to be really candid with you doing revivals because the people that came before and created it did all the heavy lifting. And then you're just coming and either have a new take or decorating it, but the libretta and the score is there. And so there is a certain, for me, guilt associated with that. However, with shows like Big River, where we reinvented the show because it was the first time half the cast was deaf and half the cast was hearing. I didn't feel guilty about that because I do feel like we added something that enhanced the show. It didn't just make it different. It actually enhanced it. Most well, revivals I, are just different. I think you did the same thing with Grease. You gave it a kind of an MTV feel to it. Well, John McDaniel is one of the heroes of that show. MTV had just come out. And so my intention was to take every number in it and make it its own MTV video if you would, if that makes sense. And I know that Jim Jacobs, the, the writer, I don't think he loved our production. I think he thought we strayed too far from the original, but for my money and John's money and Tommy Toon's money, I don't think the original arrangement, so much time had passed that I don't think the original arran arrangements and would have been as exciting. And I don't think we could have lasted four years if John hadn't reinvented the score. And if we didn't have the amazing Billy Porter playing Teen Angel, which of course is usually played by a white guy doing Pat Boone. But Pat Boone used to take some of Little Richard's songs and make them popular. And so I wanted to go back to the source. And so my idea was to take Teen Angel and make him sort of Little Richard. And Billy Porter stopped the show every night. And while he was doing the show, I can tell you he loved every minute of it. Sam Harris was duty and Magic Changes also stopped the show. It was revelatory. And so we tried, that's really John McDaniel. He was a big hero on the success of that show. Yeah, it was wonderful. I thoroughly enjoy it. But I've always wondered, I'm so glad I get to ask you this, why the big hit song from the movie, Grease, Hopelessly Devoted to You, was not in your version of the Broadway show. Do you know why? I do know why. It was too expensive. You're kidding. It was it all was about too, money? It was too expensive, and we didn't feel we needed it. And Tommy was at home listening to the radio, and Since I Don't Have You was playing on the radio, and Tommy heard that and called me and said, hey, we don't need that other song. It's too expensive. I know what we can do. And that was Tommy's idea to put that song in instead. And you want to know something? We were worried. Would the show be successful without that song? And in the four years that it ran, ran and with all the tours that happened, I don't recall one person coming up to me saying that they missed the song. No, you're right. We didn't miss the song. It's only when you watch the movie that you think, oh, that song wasn't in the show. But while you're watching the show, you don't even think of it. Yeah, I hadn't seen the movie. Of course, I knew it was a popular song. I knew the song, but I, I hadn't seen the movie. Well, now, of course, I have to ask you about Any Get Your Gun. I absolutely loved Reba's performance in that show. And many people felt she was the perfect Annie Oakley. What was she like to work with? She'd never been on Broadway before. No, she, it was perfection. She is Annie Oakley. I mean, she understood guns, her accent. She didn't have to put on an accent. She was as nice as she is talented, but born to play that role. Absolutely born to play that role. And I have to say, working with the amazing Graziella Danielle, who was the director and my co-choreographer, that was also one of the most thrilling things. The two thrilling things, three, was working with Bernadette, working with Reba, and working with Graziella. 
And Brent Barrett was wonderful in that too. Oh, Brent was great too. And it, it, Tom Wopat was wonderful in the show. We were, you know, we were blessed with a really good, really good cast. But but Reba was definitive without a doubt. Oh, she just, I was amazed she had the stamina to do Broadway. It's not something that a lot of pop stars, even if they do concert tours, Broadway's different. Oh yeah, but, well, that's a good point, Harvey, because I'll tell you, Reba is blue collar work ethic and the theater is blue collar. You don't have a trailer and makeup artists, you know, you're backstage, it's grungy, your dressing rooms are small. It's real blue collar work and not everyone's cut out for it, but Reba certainly had the right disposition for that. Now, it seems to me, Jeff, that you have a particular gift for discovering and cultivating young talent. You discovered Sutton Foster, Megan Mullally, Sherry Renee Scott, and many others. We've seen your work with young people in High School Musical and Grease and Newsies and his story. Where do you get that knack from for identifying star quality in young performers? Well, I'm... I just think I'm lucky enough to be in the right place when they walk into the door. But also I have, I've said this before, but I have two God-given talents. Tap dancing, for some reason, I just, I, tap dancing is in my blood. And I'm also a very good judge of character. And that goes a long way in casting a judge of character. Very few times do I get fooled. So it's interesting you were mentioning character rather than talent or charisma or stage presence. Why character? I think all of those are a subset of character. So certainly I don't mean to exclude those, but I think they're all a subset of somebody's character. But yes, they definitely have to have that star quality and that it, it factor. But also at this point in my life, that's not enough. You know, you also want to have a good time. It's hard enough to make a show successful that you don't want to be dealing too much with people's personal problems and so even to this day if i really like a performer now we're not talking about stars obviously but when you're casting the rest of the show in the ensemble if i'm really taken with somebody i'll leave the room when they leave and pretend to go to the bathroom to watch how they are outside of the room just to be sure it's the same person because you want a person to be a team player and to not have a lot of drama and emotional baggage i get it that's right leave the drama on the stage not in the wings so have you ever watched an audition and thought to yourself, oh, my God, this person is so good, I should just become their manager? I thought that I thought that with um, Renee Scott, Sherry Renee Scott. I remember saying to her after her audition, you know, this is the first time I've ever felt like I met somebody who I would give up my career to manage. She blew me away. She absolutely blew me away because Megan Mullally is astonishing. And I thought, how are we going to replace Megan? And then in walked Sherry Renee Scott. Wow. That's the first time that ever happened to me that I can recall. But clearly, you know, when we were doing the Will Rogers Follies and looking for women for the national tour, and I was in Detroit and in walked Sutton Foster at, I think, 17, wearing flip flops and really short shorts. Not really how you dress for an audition, but at 17, you, you can forgive that. But as soon as she opened her mouth and kicked up to her eyes, you knew you were in the presence of someone that was going to be doing this the rest of their life. No doubt about that. That's for sure. Have you ever considered directing a solo show for some of the Broadway stars you've worked with? Oh, no, I hadn't thought of that. But if they would ask me, I would certainly love to do that. I can't imagine that they wouldn't want you to do it. That's for sure. And when you direct and choreograph a show, does Jeff Calhoun, the director, ever get into conflict with Jeff Calhoun, the choreographer? No, it actually, back when I actually did do both and at a certain level, I found one enabled the other. So, you know, it was seamless. You didn't really know where the scene ended and the, chore the director ended and the choreographer took over. The same with the movement of the scenery. Uh, to me, I see shows as sculpture and all of the show, even blocking as choreography. But Harvey, I have to tell you, those days are... I, as a director, I'm only limited by my imagination. As a choreographer, I was someone that had to be on my feet and try to create the steps and look in the mirror. And with back surgery and four knee surgeries, I'm better off working with a young choreographer and letting my experience help make them the best they can be. I mean, well, Newsies would not have been successful if I had to direct and choreograph it. 
you know, we we're better off because we had Chris Catelli. And I just, for me personally, choreography is a young person's game. Yeah, I didn't realize you'd had all those surgeries. You really put your body through the mill. Well, between football, which I played when I was younger, and dancing, yeah, it, <laughs> I'm, I, I'm certainly paying the price and grateful that I can make a living just with my imagination and not with my body. <laughs> Well, I'm sure you get a lot of projects submitted to you. So how do you decide which projects you want to get involved in? It's a good, you know, there's two answers to that. One is you don't, I don't get as, as many as I would like, to be honest with you. There's a lot of competition out there. And the ones that I do get have to really inspire me because it takes years to get a show on. And it has to be a project that you fall in love with, that you want to, go to bed with and wake up with for years. And so that eliminates a lot of them. And quite frankly, I like to I like to create my own projects as well. You know, I'm so driven to do this. I'm, I'm a bit of a workaholic. Next to my family and my husband, there's nothing I love more than working. And so currently I'm working on two original musicals that that I've I've created. One is based on Mr. Kenley. We talked about the Kenley players earlier. One is on Mr. Kenley, and the other is an original Deaf West musical that will be starting at La Jolla Playhouse next season. And I'm very excited about both of those projects. But again, I generated those because I needed, you know, I needed to work and want to work. Well, let me ask you about the West Deaf Theater in Los Angeles. You have a very strong connection with that theater. Mm -hmm. For the benefit of our viewers, this is a theater that produces shows in sign language with simultaneous voice translation. Jeff, how did you become involved in that organization? Yeah, I had a, it really changed my life, Harvey. Working with Deaf West made me a better director, made me a better person. And to this day, is the highlight, I think, of my career is working with Deaf West. I got a call from a friend of mine who said the artistic director, whose name is Ed Waterstreet, wanted to do the first musical at Deaf West. And I didn't really understand that at the time. I was thinking, how are, how are deaf people going to do a musical? And so I flew out there and we talked. And it was the hardest thing to this day I've ever done because you have to teach all of the hearing actors had to learn all of their dialogue and lyrics in ASL, American Sign Language. And all of the deaf actors had to learn to sign to music that they couldn't hear. And so it was challenging for the hearing actors and it was challenging for the deaf actors. But it's also the most rewarding when you finally figure it out. But it's it was very difficult. But I'm grateful for that phone call from Bill O'Brien because it really did change my life. Well, I believe you're speaking about the first original American Sign Language musical, Sleeping Beauty Wakes. It was highly acclaimed, won you two Ovation Awards. Is there a different sensibility that you draw upon when you direct a show that's going to be delivered in sign language? No, it's just more difficult, obviously, figuring out the built-in cues. But with Sleeping Beauty Wakes, and it was a lovely show, but it wasn't about deafness. Uh, every show I've done up until now with Deaf West has been completely equitable, 50% of the cast hearing 50% deaf, every moment was both signed and voiced. That's true of Sleeping Beauty Wakes, even though it was an original musical, it was still in my mind inviting the deaf into the hearing world. With the new show I have called Elephant Shoes, it's a modern adaptation of Cyrano and Cyrano is deaf. And it's the first time we'll be inviting the hearing world into the deaf experience. And it's going to be very challenging for audiences, but every moment is not equitable. There will be times when the lead does not have an interpreter within the story where they'll have a scene or they'll have a song and we will not hear, no one will voice for them. We'll have to read their lyrics. There will be scenes between two deaf characters where we'll have to read the dialogue. Same for the deaf. There'll be scenes between two hearing people. If there's not a deaf person in the scene where they'll have to read the dialogue. So we're going to try to do a true representation of what life is like through our leading character, Cyrano, who happens to be deaf. And I think this will be the first time that's been explored, certainly on Broadway. And it's very exciting. It sounds fascinating. It sounds very inclusive. It sounds like something I would certainly want to see. 
Now, you've said that Big River was probably the hardest assignment you've ever had in the theater and ultimately the most fulfilling. Why? Well, I think it goes hand in hand, right? Things that are the most painful when they heal are the most rewarding. I think after a severe heartbreak, if you're lucky, you're more loving at the end of it. I think life is about opposite emotions and directly proportionate. So I think my the proportion of my joy and and pride in the accomplishment of Big River is mathematically equivalent to how difficult it, it was. That's because you push yourself a lot. Well, I mean, I love it. Again, I think the, the I push myself mathematically to the degree I'm passionate for what I do. I think it's I'm lucky wonderful to be doing exactly what I love to do. Yeah, I was just going to say that it's wonderful that you can do what you love doing and that at this stage of your life and career you can choose what you want to do that really motivates you and inspires you. Well, let me tell you you also inspire me, Harvey. What you have done just for, as a judge and an openly gay judge and having for Edie performed the first same-sex marriage. I mean, you're you're a remarkable, you're a remarkable man, Harvey. And it's really an honor to be in your presence. And when I watch your 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 shows, everybody says that. Everybody says there's no interviewer that's more prepared than you are. And just what was how much respect they have for you and being in your presence now, I second all of those comments by all the people that you talk to. You're really a very rare, rare person, Harvey. Oh, Jeff, thank you so much. You got me all for clamped. For clamped. For clamped. <laughs> oh, I must, I must, I must mention, Harvey, that you brought up Ivan Menchel. Ivan's also the librettist on Elephant Shoes. I cannot wait to see that show. Well, thank you for your very kind comments. It's quite an honor having you here. Now, tell me about your national touring production of Nine to Five, the musical. It was very different than the Broadway show. Why did you feel those changes were necessary? Well, the Broadway show was too expensive to tour, to be really candid with you. You know, touring, you're limited by how many seats there are in the theater and how much money does it cost to get the show from one city to the other? How many trucks will it cost? How big is the crew that you have to travel? How big is the cast that you have to pay per diem and put up in hotels? And so it really came down to money. And one of the great things I learned from Tommy Toon is how to use your imagination rather than just your checkbook. And so my assignment was, how can I take this story which actually is a very intimate, small story and reduce the production to something that can tour and still give the audience that wow factor they expect when they go to the theater. And as we talked about earlier, it took me three times to really get it right. I, I did a, an American tour of the show and I think we did succeed in making it a fun evening for people, but I was certainly not happy with it and knew it could be better. And I was fortunate enough to have the opportunity to do a tour in the UK. And so I met with Dolly and Pat Resnick, the writer, and we worked on it. And I think we did make it better. But still, I thought, you know, I don't think we've cracked this yet. I still think there's more work to be done. And then I was asked to do it at the Savoy Theater in the West End. And then we really knuckled down and said, OK, how can we make this the definitive production? And I realized it was about not being so beholden to the film. There were things we took for granted that we thought we could never cut because they were iconic in the film. Well, what took me two times to learn is that's no reason to keep it because we're not going to compete with that. They're iconic in the film, so we're going to lose by comparison on the stage. And I'm talking specifically about all of the dream sequences that each three ladies have about wanting to kill the boss. And so we jettisoned that part of the story, asked Dolly to write one song that encapsulated all three of those moments. And we took what was 27 minutes on stage, made it two and a half minutes, and we were better for it on every level. And I think we had a, a much more successful production, but it took three times for that to happen. Now, you mentioned that Reba had a blue collar work ethic. Is that true for Dolly as well? Oh, 100 percent. Dolly. 100%. I think of all the people that I've ever worked with, Dolly is the one that makes me smile the most. 
her authenticity is off the charts. Authenticity, which is, she's such a, a conundrum because she's the most, for someone who is completely artificial as far as body parts, wigs, did it, she's the most real person that I've ever worked with. So it's really fascinating. Well, I think that's the secret to her enormous popularity is that th through all of that glitz, we see the real person. And uh, I, I've seen her on stage many times. I just think she is a goddess. Really. You know, a lot of times you, you meet people that you admire and there's what you call the crash factor because there's a bit of a letdown between the reality and what you wanted. With Dolly, it's she even exceeds your wildest dreams of what kind of person she is. She's you just never hear a bad word about Dolly. She's pretty, she's angelic. And, and what a talent. at the same time, she's remar she's remarkable. And what a talent. I mean, you tell her you need her to write a song for this one scene, and she does it. And not only does she do it, but within 48 hours, a fully produced demo comes to you. It, it's really amazing. She takes it very seriously. She does not phone it in. And when you're with her, she makes you feel like you're the most important person in the world. And that's a real gift. And I think that's why she's universal, universally loved. Absolutely. Now, your production of Newsies was actually your second time working with Disney after creating the stage production of the Disney films High School Musical and High School Musical 2. The Disney company is known for being very controlling. Did you get full creative control? Oh, I wouldn't want full creative control. When you have Tom Schumacher at the helm, you want to you want to be you want to listen to him very carefully. It doesn't get any better for me from a producerial point of view than working with Disney. No, I didn't find that to be I didn't find that to be true at all. When you adapt a movie into a stage production, which you've done a number of times and you've talked about today, what would you say are the biggest challenges you have to deal with? I think I've been fortunate that, you know, Newsies was a cult film, but it was, certainly was not a box office hit. So we were taking something where there was room for improvement. What I marvel at is when people tackle classic movies, like, well, I won't mention, but, and then think that the musical will improve on them. I'm not brave enough to do that. I, I think Jerry was brilliant. Jerry Mitchell was brilliant in taking Kinky Boots, again, an underground small film, and there was room to make it bigger and better. And I think Newsies falls into that category as well. So for me, I'm interested in taking a property where I see room for improvement. Tackling a classic would be very intimidating to me. And maybe unwise. Well, you said that I didn't. <laughs> when I was doing my research for this interview, I read that you never saw the movie of Newsies or Greece. Is that right? Yeah, that is correct. And I'm grateful for that because I did it, through osmosis, you would inadvertently steal. And I didn't want to just take Kenny Ortega's great work and put it on stage. After I did my work, I went back and watched the films but not be, not before. The stage production of Newsies was originally supposed to be a one-time production for the Paper Mill Playhouse, and it evolved into a Broadway show. Isn't that amazing? There was, Harvey, there was some inevitability about that show that you just, you wish every show would have it, but that you're absolutely correct and people don't believe it, but they literally just did that show at Paper Mill so they could license the show to stock and amateur and so high schools and community theaters and colleges could do the show because people were doing their own versions. And Disney thought, why are people doing their own versions? We're not making any money. Why don't we create a, pro a property that we can license so at least we can make money off of these productions? And that was the intention. Your production of Newsies was actually filmed at the Pantages Theater in Hollywood. I think I saw it on Amazon Prime. Yes, Have it is on, uh, I. Yeah, Disney Plus or Amazon Prime or maybe both. I don't understand the streaming very well, but what a thrill that was. And again, that's what I'm talking about. A producer like Tom Schumacher, we were at the at the, the Pantages Theater in Los Angeles, and it was the last week of the tour. And what we did is we extended one week so we could still be in the theater with the scenery. 
And we shot the show in an empty theater on our set, just like it was a movie for six days. And then on the seventh day, we did fill the Pantages and do our final performance so we could get reaction shots from the audience. And just to support my point about Disney being amazing producers, how many people have done it that way? They did it first class. If you're working with Disney, nothing gets done half-assed. It's always first class. Have any of your other stage productions been filmed? Yes, actually. We filmed, uh, the last show I did was an off-Broadway musical, an adaptation of Jody Picot's novel, Between the Lines. And with a beautiful score, a, a really nice book. And we did film it. And we're in the process of now of finding someone to distribute it. Would you like to see more Broadway shows get filmed so these stage performances aren't lost? I mean, the obvious answer is yes, but it's expensive to do it right. And I think they need to be done right. You know, the reason that more the Tony Awards have such, in my opinion, low viewership is what's created for the stage is not the same as being created for a camera. You do things differently for a camera than you do on stage. And so to just film a theater piece it will make it, it won't do it justice. So if you want to do it, I think you have to spend the money, go up on stage and really film it the way you would film a movie. And short of that, I think in a way it might do the inverse. It might hurt people's perception of theater, especially in these times where theater is struggling. I think people learned during the pandemic that they have the best entertainment in the world right in their living rooms on their TV. So we have a real responsibility to create exciting things to make people go back to the theater and feel like they got their money's worth. For sure, because the tickets are expensive. If you want to take, uh, it's ridiculous. You, you know, you want to take your family to a, to see a show on Broadway. It's a lot of money. Yeah, it is a lot of money, and and, and there's going to be there has to be a reckoning soon. And it's not just one person's fault. I think everyone is responsible. I think somebody from every union just needs to all get together and all agree listen, this is what we're going to do to cut costs. And I think it's everyone's responsibility to do that. Jeff, I want to read you something you said in an interview with Playbill in 2004. You said, and I'm quoting you here, I love when shows feel like they have their finger on the pulse of what's happening. I love it when a show has music you can actually listen to in your home and not have to be in the business to enjoy. I would love kids who do not live in New York and are not interested into going into show business to want to listen to the music from a show. I want Broadway show music to be accessible. So Jeff, in that interview, you were talking about the music from Brooklyn, but it made me wonder, what do you think of all those jukebox musicals that are using pop music instead of original songs? I think it's terrific if they can figure out a narrative that warrants the music to make it a completely theatrical experience and not just a concert. I mean, there's a show right now doing it called And Juliet that I think is done really, really well. It's a very clever book, but there were existing songs. It was a jukebox musical. The very first Broadway jukebox musical, I believe was my one and only, where they took all these Gershwin songs and for the first time, Peter Stone wrote a narrative that was, it was so good that people don't think of it as a jukebox musical. So I'm all for the music, you know, being contemporary, but I think you need to have a smart librettist that ties it together so it doesn't just sound like you're listening to a jukebox. And it does get people going to the theater. That you're a hundred percent, you're a hundred percent right. And I'm hoping both of the shows I spoke about, Elephant Shoes, and my John Kenley uh, musical called A Complicated Woman, they both have contemporary scores. They're not jukebox, but they have music that I think people listen to today. And I think that will be compelling. And I think both subject matters will feel like we have our finger on the pulse. It's tricky because it takes so many years for a show to happen that when it starts, you may feel like you have your finger on the pulse, but by the time it get up, gets up, it feels like yesterday's news. And I don't think that's the case with either of these shows because one deals with intersex and the other is uh, deaf. And I think both are very in the forefront of people's consciousnesses today. Oh, absolutely. I have to mention one of the most spectacular nights in your career, Jeff, May 18th, 2020. At the height of the pandemic, and despite being in the hospital with COVID, 
you somehow managed to orchestrate a benefit for Covenant House into a magnificent live streaming concert featuring Audra McDonald, Dolly Parton, John Bon Jovi, Meryl Streep, Morgan Freeman, Dionne Warwick, so many others. That event set new standards, not only in digital streaming events, but in fundraising for homeless youth. And I'm so happy to have this opportunity, Jeff, to shine a light on that achievement by congratulating you in this interview. It was remarkable what you did. Well, thank you, Harvey. And the best part of that is we raised over $10 million for an organization that is so close to my heart, Covenant House. Well, it's so interesting that you're involved with Covenant House because in 2004, you produced and directed a show called Brooklyn, which was about homelessness. Mm -hmm. What drew you to that project? Well, the score and the creator, Mark Schellenfeld, he was just so out there and unique. I'd never met anyone like him. Problem, unfortunately, with Brooklyn, and it's what Jack O'Brien, legendary director Jack O'Brien, told me at the time. He said, Jeff, be careful not to get seduced by a score. It, the book has to be just as strong. And I think the problem with Brooklyn was as good as the score was, the narrative didn't quite, didn't quite equal that. But uh, Covenant House... Uh, Kapathia Jenkins, who was in Newsies for me, gave her notice for Newsies at the peak of our success. And I asked her why. And she said, well, there's this organization I want to get more involved with. And I thought she was, you know, crazy to be leaving a hit show for, for, for a charity. And she brought me into Covenant House. And I heard its president and CEO, Kevin Ryan, talk about how this organization is helium for these kids' dreams who are living with homelessness. And it moved me so deeply that, you know, it's show business, maybe anything where you're successful, it becomes very selfish, Harvey. And I was feeling like I was having a very selfish existence. And to find something like Covenant House, where you could get out of yourself and make someone else more important than you, it was a blessing for me. And I still think to this day, I get more out of it than anything I could do for our youth. But Covenant House is close to my heart. And thanks for mentioning that streaming show we did on Amazon Prime. But I was just one of many people that made that made that successful. Well, I just think you're such an amazing person. You've had such an incredibly monumental career. Do you have any interest in sitting down and writing a memoir? No, I don't have a skill to write. My talents are visual. I wish I could. I also don't have a very good memory, Harvey. I have to be honest with you. I know I've had this. I've been very blessed and fortunate, but I can't remember half of the exciting things that have happened to me. So I just don't have that gift. And when you're around people like Tommy Toon and Peter Stone and actually um, Alan Carr, if you remember Alan Carr from Hollywood, he was one of the great raconteurs. And so when I'm in the presence of raconteurs like that, it's when I realize I don't have that gift. It's like what I said about Tommy Toon and realizing I'll never really be the artist he is. I, I hopefully be, I'll be successful and I'll do things artfully. But when you're in the presence of a real artist like Tommy, I think the definition of a genius, I think Peter Stone told me that. If you're not a genius, you know it. If you are a genius, you don't know it. <laughs> and so... I definitely know that what I what I'm not, and I think a lot of success is knowing your shortcomings and surrounding yourself with people that fill those voids. But that's an aspect of being a genius. That kind of judgment, the kind of instincts and intuition you have, your capacity to be so humble, I think does make you a genius. But I'm a big fan. What can I say? Now you know you directed a show at the Ford's Theater called Violet. And there's oh. a great lyric in that show that says there are two kinds of people in this world. Some say yes and some say no. I want to tell you, Jeff, how happy and grateful I am that you said yes to this interview. Thank you so much for taking the time to appear on our show. Harvey, thank you. And what a testament to your genius that you could take something so poetic as a lyric from that and turn it into the end of this episode. It's a real pleasure, Harvey. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our guest has been one of America's most respected directors and choreographers, Jeff Calhoun. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to my producer, Steve Silver, my director of programming, Deborah Batsafin, my production assistant, Rosa Puzo, my PR directors, Eileen Shapiro and Jimmy Starr, and my entire team at the XPTV1 Network in the UK. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time.
Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.